So I'm Stanislas Tieno from Champagne Tieno, and uh, we are a quite young house of Champagne, founded by my father in 1985, which is a little bit uh, unusual in, uh, in the landscape of uh, houses of Champagne. You know, most of them, they have uh, several centuries of existence. But uh, my family is originally from uh, the region, not in the Champagne business. It's my father who started, and he started as a grapes broker. So I don't know if you are familiar with champagne, but uh, voilà, 90% of, uh, of the sales they are made by the houses of champagne, but 90% of the land belongs to the vine growers. So on average, a house of champagne has like uh, 85% of its sourcing through uh, grapes agreement with the vine growers and 15% uh, of sourcing through their vineyard. And so the grapes broker is this uh, is the middleman between the vingrowers and the houses of champagne. And so as a grapes broker, uh, you spend uh, most of your time in the vineyard uh, to understand uh, how work the different vingrowers, to understand the different terroirs. And you spend also a great part of your time with, uh, with the chef de cave, the different chef de cave of uh, the houses to understand the, the philosophy, the style of the house, and to find a good match between uh, the vine growers and the houses of Champagne. And so my father did that during uh, 20 years. He started in uh, 68. Uh, and uh, thanks to that, he acquired uh, quite a deep knowledge about uh, the terroir, uh, the good and the bad vine growers, and he wanted to use his knowledge for himself. Uh, and that's why he decided to create Champagne Tieno in 1985. Also, when he was grapes broker, he started to purchase some vineyard. Uh, uh, the first vineyard he purchased was in 1976 in Ai, six hectares. Ai is a Grand Cru. And, uh, and after, in 79, he purchased also two hectares in the Côte des Blancs. In 1980, uh, uh, two or three hectares uh, around uh, Epernay. And so when uh, he created Champagne Tieno, he, he brought his uh, his experience, his knowledge, and the vineyard he purchased. And this is how Champagne Tieno started with the uh, so creation of the house in uh, 85, first wine on the market in uh, 88. And since the beginning, we decided to really focus on the on trade. It's, uh, it's still now 90% of our, uh, of our uh, distribution um, in France and uh, in the export. And, uh, and today, Champagne Tieno, we own 30 hectares, uh, around 50% are located in Grand Cru and uh, Premier Cru. Ah, it was a little bit uh, unusual uh, at this time. People, they didn't think it's you're crazy. They, they were more thinking, uh, you know, they look at you and uh, they believe you, you will not succeed. Um, voilà, but uh, <laughs> finally the story said something else. But also when he started at this time, he, he started in, so in 85, but also two other people quite famous in Champagne, Bruno Payard and, uh, and Paul, so Paul François Vranken, started also roughly at the same time, just a little bit before. I think uh, Vranken was in 76 and uh, Bruno Payard in 81. So the, and in fact, it was the last newcomer in Champagne. No, not really, because when, uh, when we moved in Reims for, because of the, enfin, thanks to the creation of the house in 1985, I was, uh, I was uh, almost 10 years old and, um, and I left uh, my parents' house in '94, so just nine years after. So finally, uh, uh, I saw the, the beginning of the company when I was ten years old. Uh, we were living uh, in the in the Champagne house, so it was very nice as a kid. You know, you see the I don't know the lift, the bottle, mm. the caps of our. It's a it's a nice playground, the cellar also. Mm. Uh, but you know, from ten. To, uh, to 17 years old, it was just seven years. Finally, I was just uh, in immersion during seven years. And also, you have to know, in 1990, there was a huge crisis in Champagne um, because of the, um, 
the financial crisis in 87 and after the real estate crisis and uh, champagne has been uh, very uh, deeply affected by this crisis and so even my father he didn't really speak about uh, he speak about the champagne the house but he was not certain the house would be there after this crisis you know it's it's the beginning the house was like five years old uh, and uh, you, you enter in a very uh, strong crisis so it's very difficult for you to to see the future so that's why it was always quite uh, uh, pudic I don't know the word in uh, shy, mm. shy uh, yeah. uh, uh, about speaking about the house so we have we have evolved we have grown in this universe but uh, not really speaking about that and I left at 17 so. and so I realized after that champagne is a wonderful product is a wonderful drink and it was a shame not to to try to to work with the family for this uh, wonderful product and finally you know champagne you as we say in French you put um, a finger mm. in and uh, it takes all your arm <laughs> <laughs> like that so you cannot go back mm. A very basic, <laughs> really, you know, uh, we, well, you have to do all the boring stuff, you know, like uh, accounting, figures, so, so I have to do a little bit, your mail, like everybody, <laughs> and after, uh, after we, it's, it's a split between the, our partner, mm -hmm. as Vingoros, uh, all the, um, uh, the winemaking with our chef de cam, so it's a split between that and after our customer and partner on the market. So voila, there is a little boring part of uh, voila, all the accounting and everything. And after the interesting part, which is, uh, as I told you, a split between uh, the sourcing mm -hmm. and our customer. Mm -hmm. Alors, it's quite a long process. We start just after the harvest. Uh, if you go in, if you come in our winery, you see that we like we have like around 150 tank. And in fact, in this tank there is a part of reserve wine, and we have fresh wine from the harvest. Basically, two thirds are dedicated, or or 75 percent are dedicated to to welcome the new harvest every year and we have like between one quarter and one third of tanks full all the time for wither wine. This 150 tanks they are like a, uh, each tank is a spicy, is a flavor and just after the harvest uh, we, we spend quite a lot of time uh, at least twice a week to test all the tank, not the wither wine tank but the, the tank with the, with the, the harvest to uh, to understand the harvest the profile of the harvest and uh, to see how also how the wine change mm -hmm. and uh, the idea is to have in your mind uh, well, to, to understand and to, to know by heart all the flavor all the spicy we have in the winery to be able to create from scratch every year the new non-vintage blend we do it by scratch uh, if you look at on uh, our wine on the back label from a, from a year to another year you will see we can have some strong change in terms of blend because the idea is to recreate exactly the same style but by definition every crop is different and so to achieve that uh, sometimes the proportion in terms of reserve wine the proportion in terms of uh, different grapes they change a lot and we don't want to be prisoner of uh, you know, like one third, one third, one third. For example, because historically some houses used to do that. Uh, we are ready to really change the blend every year. So it's a long process doing three or four, uh, sorry, two to three months to memorize all the winery and to figure out what will be the blend. And after in December, we start to work on, uh, on pre-blend. Uh, so uh, all our uh, analogy committee, uh, me as a family plus our chef de cave and the person in charge of the winery, uh, start to uh, to create some uh, what we call some pre blend, and after we do uh, all together uh, final uh, fin, 
blind testing on that. And this process lasts uh, around uh, like one month, one month and a half. Indeed. Yeah. And that's why it's important to test the wine from the harvest as a juice before being a wine uh, during several months to figure out how the wine change because, because it will give you also a, a picture of the evolution after and so it's really really helpful but as you say it's very complicated it's not an accurate science and sometimes also we, we did some bottling on vintage wines, uh, vintage wines, special vintage, special cuvee vintage, and sometimes we never launch the wine on the market because, uh, by with the evolution, we did some mistakes. We, we believe the wine had the, the potential of evolution, keeping its profile, the profile we wanted, and finally it's not the case, and so we don't. We decide not to launch this wine on the market, and what we do, but we. We reintegrate the, the wine, we open the bottle and reintegrate them to the next harvest. Okay, yeah. But it's, uh, and, and we do mistakes, like uh, everybody. The, the winemaking is at the service of the style you want. So my father had a, uh, when he was a broker, uh, when he created his house, he has a very accurate idea of the style he wanted and so um, thanks to that uh, we have completely adapted uh, not completely from the beginning uh, it takes time also but we have adapted our winemaking to the style we want to achieve and this is also the same in terms of uh, sourcing uh, of the grapes uh, what i can um, for example, uh, we we like to we don't like oxidation. We are we want uh, to have a wine very um, a very clean, very fo focus on the, on primary flavors, the nice expression of the fruit, and and to do that, for example, we don't we don't use at all oak barrel, 100% steel tank. Uh, we really pay attention to uh, when we when we handle the wine to avoid any contact oxygen contact to completely preserve the wine. Uh, during the disgorgement we use the jetting method, for example. So all these things, it's really to achieve the style we want. When we do the malolactic, sorry for uh, being a little bit technical, but when we do the malolactic fermentation, uh, we do it before the end of the alcoholic fermentation. Like that, the malolactic is very short and we extract less uh, you know, a milky uh, yogurt flavor to, to keep the purity of the fruit. Uh, so, and, and it's the same in terms of sourcing. We, we, uh, when, uh, we, we try to focus in terms of sourcing with a, a terroir and grapes which can match with, uh, with our style. For example, we, 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 have a, we don't have that much of Pinot Meunier because the evolution of Pinot Meunier uh, the Pinot Meunier can switch uh, quicker on the secondary tertiary flavors and we want to keep this focus on primary flavors. And so that's why we have a, a little bit of uh, we have Pinot Meunier in uh, our non-vintage, sometimes in our vintage wine, but it's quite rare for, for this reason. Well, it's, a, it's a big big problem. I don't know if it's a big problem. It's, it's an issue for sure. What I can say is we never made so good champagne for the last two decades. I, I think the quality of champagne is really the best quality we never had. Thanks to the global warming because in the past you have to imagine we, we used to have some uh, crop uh, with um, um, very low crop because of a uh, strong frost mm -hmm. in the winter, like in 1985, 20% of the, of the vine in Champagne uh, has been destroyed by the very strong uh, frost during winter, it was in, uh, in January. Mm -hmm. 
for example, in some year, like uh, in, in the end of the 70s, uh, uh, we used to, we, we didn't have any summer, and finally in October, uh, mid-October, we harvest grapes with a very high acidity and a natural level of sugar at 6 degrees, 7 degrees. So you, bon. And all this uh, clim, uh, climate uh, let's say, uh, damage, mm. uh, we are facing really less for the last two mm. decades. And also we have a better maturity than in the past. Mm -hmm. bon. Saying that, if uh, the global warming keep on uh, increasing, and this is the case, uh, it's an issue, especially for the acidity. Mm. Um, for our reserve wine, our capacity, ability to keep fresh our reserve wine, uh, and uh, also in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wine, we, we, are, we have less and less acidity, like the last harvest, uh, 2022. But now, uh, to, to, to solve that, uh, for example, we don't do at, uh, all the time the malolactic fermentation. Mm. Uh, Champagne Tieno, until uh, like five, five, six, seven years ago, it was 100% malolactic. Mm. And now uh, it's uh, between 80 to 90%. There is no rules. So we manage without malolactic, with malolactic in the winery. We also had to learn how to do that because it's a, it's a little bit more complicated. But now we, we do it uh, well, so we are happy with that. And so this is a way to, uh, to, to keep the freshness of the wine. But the most important thing is the terroir, and the terroir is not changing. Uh, we have... Uh, most of the grand terroir in Champagne is chalk. Mm -hmm. Chalk is a wonderful uh, soil to keep the acidity, the freshness, uh, to give back the water when we have very dry season. Mm -hmm. And also thanks to that, I think uh, our terroir, our soil, is a good uh, global warming uh, proof. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But it's not enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure, we have to adapt our... Uh, uh, the way we vinify the wine, and also uh, in the vineyard. You know, uh, I, I remember uh, like uh, six, seven years ago, uh, we were uh, many vine growers, and us also, we were thinking about uh, uh, take off the leaves, you know, to avoid the mildew. The mm -hmm. mildew was, uh, is the obsession in, uh, in Champagne. And so to, to, to take off uh, several leaves like that, the air, you know, you have more air current in the grapes, so it makes the, the grapes drier faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, with, uh, with uh, the year 19, 20, 22, people who, who, who has taken off the, the leaves mm -hmm. in uh, 2019, but the grapes has been burned. Mm -hmm. wow. So it's an example. Mm -hmm. So now, for a few years, we, we let more and more leaves to mm -hmm. protect the grapes. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the, from the sun. That's really so interesting. It's just yeah. an example, but uh, voilà, things are uh, the way we manage the vineyard has changed. Mm. Yeah. It was an early vintage, yeah. but finally, for, if, we, if we look at the, yeah. the, the last 10 years, uh, it was almost normal. It started by the end of August, yeah. but uh, I don't remember, but I think it's, uh, it's like the fifth or seventh yeah. times uh, for 15 years now. Um, we had a very healthy, we had very healthy grape. It was so dry during spring and summer that uh, the grapes were perfectly uh, healthy. It's not a guarantee for uh, a top vintage, but for sure all the top vintage they had um, uh, were very healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we are leaking. The acidity figures of acidity mm -hmm. are not very high, mm -hmm. but when you test the juice, uh, they have uh, you feel the freshness on the palate. So it's a little bit. Uh, uh, as you say, uh, disrupting, uh, because figures of acidity are low, but this is not the perception you have on the palate. So we will see by the times, but we are uh, quite confident, and especially uh, with the Pinot. 
Uh, the non-vintage, definitely. <laughs> But why? Because the non-vintage is a perfect champagne for all the, for uh, everything. For the breakfast, for the dinner. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, voilà, the non-vintage is an, um, it's an easier champagne, not in a, in a bad way, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, happy champagne, uh, lively, fresh. So for all the moment, Uh, so that's why I will take this one. <laughs> like that, I'm sure I will drink a lot of champagne. <laughs> yeah, I would too. It's a very, very, very nice one. Thank really you nice very one. much.